We appreciate you all coming out to watch about an architecture framework of extreme resilience called Camada Zero. Camada Zero is a proper name in Portuguese. So to simplify our communication today, we will be using a nickname, C0. So anytime we say C0, we are meaning our framework. Before we get started, I kindly ask you to answer some questions that I will ask to you, raising your hands in an affirmative response. So who of you here have been building and operating mission-critical applications in production environments? Yes, so we do as well. From who of you, during a situation of failure, have been little or no control to fail away from a failure on a mission critical application? Yes. So, is resilience a key topic for you, I imagine, right? So it is for us. That's why C0 is not only a framework, but also a collection of technical products and principles, especially when we are dealing with a reasonable amount of customers' requests. In Itaú Unibanco, we have nowadays more than 65 million customers, out of which 20 million are digital-only customers. Those customers are served by what we call business services. As business services, you can understand as, for example, opening a banking account, executing an electronic payment, or contracting an insurance package. We have more than 4,000 of those business services. And as one of the largest financial institutions in Latin America, we are 100,000 employees by now, out of which 14,000 are technology-specific like myself and my friend over here. We are, right now, 98 years old, so almost a centenary organization. And along the years, we have been perceiving a change in the habits and expectations of our customers. Especially in the last years, where we went through tough times during COVID's pandemic, where we were not able to leave our homes to go to physical stores and buy our goods. We had to buy them online. And it changed the way our customers are interacting with our products. So by now, they are not restricted anymore to opening hours of those stores. They can buy anything, anytime. And it required us to change culturally our organization and especially realize that technology is not here to support our business. If not, it's the core of our businesses. And as a centenary organization, we still have some monoliths running on premises, requiring us to establish a modernization strategy so we can meet our customers' expectation. So therefore, we entered in a partnership with AWS, a 10-year partnership with AWS, to build this structured roadmap, starting with peripheral applications so we could learn with them, developing and deploying those applications in, in a single AZ deployment, afterwards evolving to a multiple AZ's deployment, and so on up to multi-region and multi-AZ together. Decompounding the architecture of our applications into microservices so we could speed up the velocity we deliver new features to our customers through those business services I mentioned to you. Back in 2016, we started our experiments in the cloud by using a private cloud. And in 2020, we defined a mandate 
to be public cloud first, meaning that every single new application in Itaú has to be done on the cloud. In 2021, we speeded up the pace of our cloud migration. When I say cloud migration, I'm not mentioning re-hosting, if not re-architecting and rebuilding our applications. By the end of this year, we will, we will have 45% of our applications running on AWS. And by the end of next year, we will have 60%. Throughout those years, especially the last two, two years, we have been learning a lot. In one of those situations, back in December 2020, there was a situation hap that happened in South America East One region of AWS, where one data center of one availability zone got air conditioning problems. In that situation, the data, data center got overheated and therefore shutting down automatically some of its racks. Therefore, some of our applications that were exposed through endpoints using load balancers, we were able to fail away from that failing AZ. It's a normal situation. So it's, it's expected on the cloud where you have multiple AZs and one of them can fail. But for some other applications, where we had an API gateway as the entry point, as the error rates increased, that AZ was took away from the pool, and then no more requests being served with errors for the customers. But when the error rate decreased, it was put back on, again serving errors to our customers' requests. So in that situation, we had no control for those specific applications. Considering Brazilian market, where there is a consolidation of the market, just a few players process the whole set of transactions in the country, and Itaú being the biggest, we are responsible for processing 30% of the, all the transactions in the country daily. And that situation back in December 2020 hit us in one of our mission critical applications, impacting almost 14% of our customers. That impact for us is not affordable because for our applications, we consider any impact equal or higher than 10% of our customers are high risk impact. We are impacting our customers, and we also have implications, regulatory implications, in some cases. Capgemini generated a report saying that Brazilian e-commerce market will double in size by 2025. Could you imagine if that situation could happen in December 2025? We would have impacted much more customers. That's why from now and on for our mission critical applications, we're gonna be naming them as C0 applications, where 100% of uptime is highly desired. So we can guarantee we are up and running. With that in mind, I will switch over to my friend here to present more details for us. Thank you, Luciano. Hello, my name is George. I'm also a distinguished engineer in Itaú, and today I, I'm here to present to you something that we expect that will change irreversibly your life forever, at least in terms of thinking about resilience. Uh, as Luciano, my friend, told us, the context that we are in Brazil is critical for some of our applications. It's not for everything, of course. Um, most of our applications, I would say the majority of our applications can live in the standard architecture uh, in the resilience that we have in multi-AZ and multi-region solutions. But some of those applications, the core of our modernization, those type of applications 
are extremely critical. And for those type of applications, uh, we designed this uh, framework. It's not just one application, it's like hundred of applications, but it's not thousand of applications. So it's basically 4%, 4 to 5% of the applications that we have. Um, in the beginning, to achieve resiliency, we started thinking to build a platform. So let's build up extreme resilient platform. Let's put all the applications on top of this platform and we, we should be fine. But then when we, when we started thinking the applications, the applications has many different requirements. So we have some of the applications are low latency applications. Some of the applications are high throughput applications. So it's going to be very hard for us to have a platform that could afford all the requirements for all the applications. And then we started rethinking our strategy around resilience. And then we came up with a C0, Kamada Zero. C0 is, is then a framework. And our approach for extreme resilience is not just an architectural approach. It's something that goes beyond goes to the engineering side and also goes to the operating side. Because the combination of, of everything will deliver in the end the extreme resiliency, uh, the stability and the high availability that we want. So to sum up, C0 uh, is this framework. Uh, we think in principles and this framework, we are going to show and we are going to show the principles of all the three pillars. We will dive into one principle per pillar. And of course, we are more than glad to have a conversation aside about the other principles if you want. Uh, but keep in mind that all the principles that we designed are not just principle. We thought that principle with this extreme resilience mindset. And our mission here today is try to explain to you um, this mindset. As Luciano mentioned, um, we want to have control. Uh, we don't want to fight against failures because they will happen, but we want to have control to fail away from, from those failures, uh, minimizing MHTR, and in the end of the day, minimizing uh, customer impact, okay? Let's take a look in the architectural principles first. So those are 12, 12 architecture principles. Um, we will explore this first one, which is the scale unit based architecture. Who of you have heard about a scale unit approach? None? Okay. So we will get there. We will explain why do you, how do we approach uh, this architecture, which is, in fact, a cell-based architecture. But instead of call cells, we call them um, scale units. Let's put the, this concept of scale unit a little bit aside, and let's treat the C0 architecture as a cell-based architecture. I will explain to you what is our approach on our cell-based architecture design? And then in the end, I will come up with, uh, I will bring back the scale unit uh, concept. Um, let's dive deep into all these components. This is not a, an architecture, okay? This is an archetype of an architecture. Each application that we design uh, in the score, uh, we design with everything that, is, that has in this slide um, in mindset. Um, so let's start with this cell. What is this cell? The cell is the application. So the application lives inside the cell. The application should be self-contained. What I mean by self-contained is everything is there. The compute layer is there, database layer is there, messaging layer is there, everything that we need to deliver. The purpose of that application lives in the cell. So let's take an example. If this application is an API-based application, and we will expose this API through some services running on Kubernetes cluster, 
there will be one Kubernetes cluster per cell in this design. If this application has a DynamoDB table, there will be one DynamoDB table per cell, and so on. That's the idea of this cell. This cell has to be decoupled with the other cells. So if we have a failure in a cell, it should impact just that cell. It should not impact all the other cells. If there is a dependency among the cells, it should be loosely coupled in order uh, if it's healthy, okay. If it's failing, does not impact in the other cells. In this case, we represented the cell 1A as green, meaning it's healthy. So this, this cell is healthy. But in, in the application, what we can have is some of the cell failing, like this cell 1B, I represented in red, uh, meaning it's failing. So cell 1A is, uh, is healthy, cell 1B is failing, that's fine. Uh, uh, and it is going to be good if we can route the traffic of that API, for example, to the cell 1A. So if we route the traffic to cell 1A, 1A uh, customer will not see the failure happening in the cell 1B. Um, so that's how we approach cells. So far good? Let's move to another concept in this, in this architecture which is the shard. The shard, uh, for us, is a partition of the, of the system. Uh, it's really a physical partition of the system uh, where we put some of the customers in one shard, for instance, and other customers in other shard. So application per application, we design the shards. So we think, how can we put the shards in order to provide resiliency? Let me give you an example of one of the applications that we have that we designed shards to improve resilience. We have one critical API, which is our withdraw API. This withdraw API is used in all, all of our ATMs. So if you go to Brazil and you go to a branch and you see like five ATMs, and if a customer wanna withdraw cash, it will reach this API. If you go to a supermarket and you, you, you have two partner ATMs there and the customer wants to withdraw cash there in, in the supermarket, it will reach the same API. So it's the unique point of authorization for withdraw money for us. So this API is very critical, we don't wanna uh, we don't want to have failures on this system because we don't want to avoid our customers to uh, get their money if they need to. Um, so we approach the shards thinking in spread the ATMs, the terminals, in each specific location into different shards. So in the same example, in, in the branch, if there is five ATMs, each of the ATMs will be routed to one different shard. Meaning that if we have a shard problem, full shard problem, just one ATM of that location will be down and customer will be enabled to withdraw money in that location without having to move to another location, trying to figure out if another ATM is working or not. Um, this um, this uh, diagram also shows us that we have a different shard design in this case. So the shard can have d different designs with the cells. So in this case, this shard number two, it has the, sh the cell 2B and the cell 2C. The green means healthy and the white in case of cell 2C, means that it's not active yet, which is a not act, a active, not active design for that specific shard. The reason why we do this is to have static stability. In case of a failure, we don't wanna have to spin up new cells to afford 
the request that is incoming that, that is coming from a specific, to a specific shard. So in this case, if cell 2B is, has some problem and start becoming unhealthy, the traffic is routed for cell 2C because those two cells live in the shard 2, meaning they can answer uh, the request for that specific terminal, uh, ATMs in the case of the example, um, of that specific shard. Um, in addition to fault tolerance in case of the cell, so we use the cells in the shard for fault tolerance, but in addition to that, we also can use it for uh, scalability. So for instance, this shard has a different shard design. It's not just two cells, there are three cells, and it's, it's not in the active, not active design, but now it is in the active, active, active design. Meaning that we do have, in this case, fault tolerance because we have more than one cell, and it's mandatory for C0 to have more than one cell, but we also have a way to spread, um, to divide the, the, the demand among the three different uh, cells. So if we have something like a week in the month that is, uh, that there are some seasonality, we can spin up more cells in this type of shard. It will vary appli application per application. If the application supports the active active design, then we can implement the active active design and we can have scalability as well. Um, and that's the concern that we have when we talk about cells, just cells. There is one thing that can break the whole shard, the whole system, uh, which is scale. So if we design the application that lives in that cell, that uh, Kubernetes cluster, for instance, to support 1,000 TPS, for instance, and we receive 2,000 TPS, then probably the active cell will break, uh, the router will send the traffic to, this, to the healthy cell, the other cell will break, and all the cells will break. Uh, that's the reason why we uh, take uh, care with just the cell concept, and we came up with a, a scale unit concept. So since the beginning, when we start designing the application, the cells, the shards, we think about the scale. What would be the scale of that cell, that cell, that scale unit? What would be? Are we going to design for 100 TPS, 1,000 TPS, 10,000 TPS? We, we decide. Are we going to design for one gigabyte of data, 10 gigabyte, 100 gigabyte? gigabyte? We decide during design phase. Uh, we should have a comfort on, that, on, the, on the design of the scale unit. So when we take a look into the application and we see our peak uh, in the, on demand was X, we design the shard or the cell, the scale unit for double X because we should be comfort with that. It will be not easy uh, to increase the scale unit scalability we're gonna have to split the, the shards, or we're gonna have to rethink the application design to support uh, a higher uh, throughput in this case. Uh, so that's the reason why we, we take care with the scale. Uh, the scale is very important in this type of application, uh, and we treat the cells as scale units uh, in order to um, avoid breaking everything. Of course, I spoke a lot about routing. And it became easy to understand that we need a router in this architecture because we needed to properly route the requests not only to the proper shard where uh, the application has to end, but also to the healthy cell in that shard. If we route the, the request to an unhealthy shard, or unhealthy scale unit, 
um, it will be, you know, we, uh, we will impact our customers. So we, for that, we design a tech product, uh, which is a, a router. We call this router Compass. This is the thinnest possible router. It holds all the route logic, and it checks all the cells, all the scale units uh, healthy. And with these two information, the route, routing table and the health table, it decides uh, for, from the request that is coming where it, it is routed to. Uh, in addition to that, it could become, of course, a single point of failure. So in addition to that, the router is also a cell-based application. So we deploy this router in multiple uh, cells in order if we have something wrong with one of these cells, that's fine. We take that cell away. Uh, we, we take that cell out and the other cells of the router will receive the traffic. Another thing that we can see here is the role that an AZ does in this archetype. You can see that the cells live in one specific AZ. And that's the reason why we want to do this, of course. Uh, and we want to do this because we want to bind our failure domain, which is a cell, with the AWS failure domain, full domain, which is the AZ. So I want to avoid that a, a single AZ problem impacting the whole system. We want to definitely avoid that. So if all the cells were spread across the three AZs, the, a failure in one of the AZ would impact all the cells. And we don't want to do that. So when we spin up clusters, like a, cl a, a, a Kubernetes cluster in cell 1A, uh, we give to this Kubernetes cluster a subnet that lives inside just one AZ. It will become, uh, see, this cluster will sit in that, in that specific AZ. And that's quite important because the story that Luciano mentioned to us brought us this idea of have the maximum placement control. Again, command C0 is about having control. We want to be able to move away of uh, failures that is happening in the system. But now, when we take a look into this um, architecture or arch archetype of the architecture, and we think simple things like deploy a new version of the application, it became like much more complex. Because now it's not just one application. In this case, we have seven applications. And we also have three routers or three uh, main deployments in three different clusters of router. Uh, and in addition to that, deployment is also something that can introduce failure uh, to the application. And that's the reason why we want to orchestrate the deployments in a way that we avoid to introduce the failure to all the cells at the same time. For that reason, we designed a control plane. So a control plane, the, control, the, the C0 control plane uh, is a tech product. I represented it here uh, as a single box, but it's not a single component. In fact, it's a complex system that orchestrate all the deployments. So uh, the control plane will control a deployment stage, like starting from shard one, waiting for some time uh, before it stabilize, applying changes always in cells that are out of load. So the control plane can work together with the compass router and put the cells on load or out of load. And once the, a cell is out of load, the control plane then will deploy. The control plane can do tests on the cells that are not in production. Uh, the, control plan, the control plane can orchestrate with the compass to shadow traffic 
to the new version of the application and the old version of the application. We can um, move the deployment using Canary. And Control Plane also will avoid us uh, to deploy in every shard at the same time. Because if we do that and we introduce a bug, we will introduce a bug on the whole system. Uh, in, in the control plane logic, we also try to have a cell ready with the old version, meaning that the rollback of a version is something that we need just to switch on the router layer. We don't need to spend time, in fact, deploying things to roll back. So all these things are the responsibility of the control plane. And control plane is, is a key piece for all these architecture to, to work and to reduce complexity as well. Because otherwise, with the common tools that we have, uh, it's going to be very complicated to, to have a simple deploy, a simple bug, bug fix deployment uh, in this architecture. I will hand over to uh, Luciano that we will explore the engineering pillar. Thank you so much, George. So as George was saying, we also have some engineering principles as well. And when we think about engineering principles, we have a bunch of patterns already pretty well defined and documented through books, uh, white papers and articles related to resilience. For example, we can name a few of them, retry patterns, timeouts, or leader election, when we need to choose and pick one service to answer a specific request, or a circuit breaker where inside a service we can decide if a failing dependence should be called or not, and therefore keep serving customer requests with partial of the functions available. All of that help us on, on this situation, but let's pick an example of calling an external dependence from a service. And that's where there is our extreme resilient mindset of C0. For example, over here, who have already created a service that call an external dependence as a synchronous with a message queue in between? Yes, so do we have done that as well? And with that in mind, we're gonna choose over here one of our principles to discuss a little more. A small service with a well-defined purpose and without sharing resources. Let's think, for example, in Java programming language using Spring Boot framework, our developer can just use an annotation on top of a method to turn that method in a message consumer. And also with a single method call, turn that very same method as a message producer, which in case for us in C0 means a super responsibility because we are increasing the testing surface and also troubleshooting surface of that service. In case of any problem, we will have to troubleshoot both ways. With that in mind, let me show you a simple diagram of an example of a C0 application. With this approach over here, we separate in a more granular view the responsibility of that very same service I give as, a, as an example. First, we have a controller responsible for processing the business logic behind the orchestration of the call of the external dependency. So every single change we need over the business logic will land on that very specific service. No other part of the cell or the application will need to be changed. In the same way, there will be a dedicated repository for that controller, meaning 
that every change of the state or consumption of the state of the data will be responsibility of the controller. No other service will have access directly to the repository. So we can guarantee that any change on the data will be done through the controller. Another part of this small example is the retry logic. We put a retry logic in a service aside through a delayed message queue pattern where any change we need on the retry will land on this very specific service. And it will also help us out to monitor that queue and understand if the flow of the messages in that queue is higher than expected, meaning we are retrying more than we should on that service. The other part of the service is separating the producer from the consumer. Because on the production, producer flow downstream to the external dependency, we could implement there, for example, a validation of a schema so we can be compliant to the request <coughs> downstream to the external dependency. In the same way, the consumer, we could do the same. And in case of any change required, we do it isolated. So we're going to reduce the troubleshooting and testing surface of those two services. And we can validate in downstream and upstream flows, how they are going, if they are ex in the way we are expecting that. With that, this simple diagram seems to be more complex. At the beginning, on the build side, it will be a little more complex. But afterwards, for evolutionary maintenance, it will be easier because we have some specific parts of the application to change in case we need some specific changes. Also, as I said, it makes easier to test and to troubleshoot the application. In the end of the day, turning it more resilient, which is what we are looking for, the C0 applications. With that in mind, I hand over to George to continue to the operations. Now let's get into the hard part, operations. Usually, when we think about resilience, we don't think in the operation side. And most of the time, when we not properly operate a, a system, is when we introduce failure to, to the systems. There are a couple of, uh, there are a couple of principles here. And changes is one thing that is important. Design and implement changes is sometimes complicated when we, we want to extremely avoid uh, introduce failures. But, but as we saw in the architecture, having two different cells and have some stricted policies where we have, we always have an old version of a cell ready to be switched back, then the risk in the change, in implementation of a change reduces a lot. So that's the reason why, instead of speaking about change, besides it's very, very important, uh, I decided to dive into uh, uh, the observability part. And observability is something that we, we know. There is a lot of a lot of ways to make an application observable. Uh, it's needed. For sure, a, a mission-critical application should be observable, and we should understand if it's working or not as soon as, we, as soon as we can. But in fact, the application should be observable, which is, this, the, uh, which is the first principle. But in fact, the topic that I, I brought here today to cover uh, is something related to the uh, alert platform that is coupled to the observability. Um, one of the things that we usually see is that we have a mission-critical mission application. And then we have metrics for everything, infrastructure, network, application, business, everything. 
And then we put on a lot of alarms. Threshold on the CPU, memory, kill, kill length, kill latency, everything. And then when we have a problem, we, we receive a, a storm of alerts. And we don't know what to do. Because there are too many uh, alerts uh, coming uh, that we, we don't exactly understand what is happening. Um, what, I, what we've saw also, we've seen also, is something that we put a lot of alarms and then we live with some of the alarms firing. We live, production, hundreds of alarms firing. And then you go to the engineer, hey man, there are hundreds of alarms firing. Oh, that's common, that's okay. The alarms are there since the beginning. Uh, uh, I can tell you the application is working. Oh, okay. Uh, that's not what we want in C0 applications. So here, I'm, I'm going to show how we approach, especially how can we prioritize alerts that are more important and, and in fact can represent a real impact on the customer side. And we are using SLOs, uh, which is also a pretty common concept of having an objective for some of the uh, service levels that, that we want to have. Um, but to make it more clear, I will switch to a quick demonstration how we are approaching SLOs. First thing, we start, um, we start measuring everything. So we have measured for everything. But then we have to understand what is the user journey. So here is an example. It's one of the applications. Uh, this application has this journey called discovery. This is a pretty important discovery in this, uh, a pretty important journey in this application. And it impacts the customer a lot if it's not working. Um, we start mapping this uh, journey. So for this endpoint discovery to work, uh, what, ha what do we have to make it happen properly with uh, healthy? So there are a couple of um, components that we do calls uh, and uh, request response and, and things like that. Okay, then we design the contract. So we are using um, definition of a SLO contract. And in this definition of the contract, we have something related to, we have some met metadata, uh, but here we have in, uh, exactly how we are going to calculate this SLO. And here is the objective of this SLO. This SLO is a latency SLO for this journey uh, for discovery journey. So uh, we, uh, we put as, as an objective uh, to have in P90 uh, less than 500 milliseconds in this API call. This is our objective. This is what is implemented in this con into this contract. Then we can start monitoring. Of course, first thing, we do have dashboards that will show uh, the full discovery journey. So these are pretty common. SLIs, and we have alerts for everything here, uh, which sometimes are part of those alerts that we don't care. <laughs> uh, and here, I, we do have an example where we chaos testing uh, this uh, cluster. Uh, and it, during the test, you can see that the latency went up a lot here, and of course the throughput went, went down during this, um, during this test. Um, at that same time, the calculation of the SLO showed us that the SLO was not met. 
So here's the first, first thing that we, we've done. We transformed that metric P9 less than 5 milli hundred second into a percentage. So everybody that, that are in the operations today uh, don't need to understand what is the SLO, but it can understand that we are not meeting the SLO because we are, we are delivering less than 100% of the SLO. So this is standard thing is very important for the uh, operations or in the teams that, that are running. Quickly understand we are meeting or not. And then don't need to think what is the SLO. Oh, it, this latency is less than 500 or less than 200. They don't need to think about that. So we calculate the SLO and put the SLO uh, into a metric that is based on 100%. Then we can see here the, uh, the SLO, how the SLO evolved over time, and we see the SLO decrease, the, uh, the SLO decreasing uh, during, the, the, uh, during the experimentation, the chaos experimentation that we did. Actually, in fact, uh, as we have the target of 9%, then we can calculate the error budget. And this shows how the error budget is, is being consumed during the test. So here, easily, we see during 10 minutes, um, we burned all the error budget. Which is, and during that specific period of time, we were impacting the customers. Uh, of course, we also do calculate the, the error in numbers. But here is how we approach the alerts. There are a third metric that we calculate, which is the burn rate, which is, in fact, the velocity that we are burning that specific uh, error budget. Um, in this type, in this application, uh, the um, one hour window, one hour time window is the window where we can, where, where we want to alert our engineers and make them act. And when we have the burn rate going over one, means that if we don't do nothing at that time, we will burn the rest of error budget for that specific time window. So that's the trigger when we want a fire alert, an alarm. This alarm should alert the engineers, and then the engineers should come up and understand what is really happening. Probably at this time, we are going to see a lot of technical alarms firing as well. Uh, probably CPU somewhere, um, memory somewhere, errors, a network error somewhere. We don't know. Uh, it, it will be just a matter of investigate. Actually, in fact, in, in C0, we don't fight against the problem. So we will just identify which cell is presenting this latency problem, and we will move away the traffic of that cell. And then we try to understand what is happening there. But this is how we approach the alerts. So our alert systems for this mission critical application is based on the uh, burn rate of the error budget of our SLOs. And how probably you are thinking how they calculate that thing. Where do they calculate that thing? Uh, so we developed a component that lives inside the cell. So very close to the application, there is a component that keeps calculating the SLO. The SLO, the error budget, and the burn rate. The SLO, the error budget, and the error rate. And this component is part of the healthy status, meaning that if this component fails, we consider the whole cell failing. So then we cannot calculate the SLO anymore. Uh, so we should move away of that cell uh, because we don't know what's happening there, right? Uh, so that's how we approach 
SLOs for operations of C0, which are very critical applications, which we, we have very critical applications. Let me switch back to the PowerPoint, to the presentation. Um, and let's sum up. So C0, Kamada Zero, uh, is a framework of architectural principles, engineering principles, and operating principles. Um, hope, I hope that you could understand our extreme resiliency mindset, not only in the architecture using this scale unit but architecture approach, but also in one of the principles that we have in engineering, the small responsibility uh, principle, and also in the operations principle. Um, and in Kamada Zero, again, we want to have two, basically two things, the extreme resilience mindset and the maximum control. In fact, we don't want to have uh, be in a situation uh, where we have a failure happening and we have to troubleshoot that failure, users, uh, customers being impacted at that time, and we try to understand what, what's happening. So uh, in Kamada Zero, there is no situation like this. We just move away in the cell and everything should be fine. And even if we have like a complete shard or partition with a, some sort of failure, uh, it doesn't represent the whole system failure. So we reduce the blast radius as much as we can. So I hope you enjoy. I would like to thank you all. Uh, if you had time, uh, there are a couple of more hours in our booth. Uh, it's going to be a pleasure to have you there and discuss more about Kamada Zero or other products that we have in the bank. Um, and I hope uh, this presentation could change a little bit the way of your thinking on resilience. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>